announced that we are all connected here via IRC. So uh, if you use international relay chat as a system, please join us. The server name is irc.freenode.org. And uh, yes, as you can see here, and the channel name is DeepSec, obviously. Don't forget about the hash in front of its name when you join. We would like to get some feedback from you, and obviously you can uh, also uh, talk to each other about the talk and whatever. Maybe also do questions. We try to catch them and answer them as soon as possible. So I'm very happy to, uh, for the next talk, Sao Mir. And um, yes, looking very much forward to that. Ownage 2.0. Thanks, man. Thank you. Uh, morning, everyone. It's a lovely day in Vienna. It's actually one of the nicer days today. It's, it's good. So I can't wait to finish my talk and get out and leave you all folks. <laughs> yeah. You can tell this is a cooler conference because these guys use old school IRC, not like bullshit like Twitter and all that crap that goes around today. Like, what do you mean IRC? Like, what's a hash? Who the hell knows? It's like, at DeepSec on Twitter. Right? Oh no, no problem. So, um, well, these next 45 minutes or 50 minutes, I'll be uh, trying to teach you about, um, well, how to own the world is, is, is a pretty fancy title, but that's what's going on on the internet today. The race is on for your desktop, like whoever wins it keeps it and tries to get even more. Now, um, this talk can also be titled as Saumil's Bitter Criticisms on HTTP and HTML, which you'll realize that after eight years of practicing security, everybody becomes really bitter and twisted and starts cursing and spewing unparliamentary words. So that'll happen. Right, uh, quick introduction to myself. All you gotta do is this. Um, I'm still the only first Saumil on Google, so far. So that'll work. Uh, I don't Facebook, I don't tweet, I don't do any of that crap. But you can find me on LinkedIn, if you like. And there's a whole bio and all my vanity is out there. So I shall not bore you with that. Right, so what are we gonna talk about? We are gonna talk about Bill Gates' vision of being on every desktop in every home. and. So this is what we're gonna do. And uh, we wanna own every desktop. And I will say that clipart2.0 is lolcats. You gotta have, you gotta have lolcats in your presentation. Otherwise you're not cool. This is the new wave of clipart. All right, so how do you own the world? We've seen exploits. Right? You, you've talked about exploits for years. You've talked about all the web hacking stuff for years. You've talked about, oh shit, you know, I'm gonna get screwed and owned and all that. But how does it all come together? And that's what this talk is all about. How do you piece together evolution or lack of it? Um, how do you see what's coming up next? What is the, what, what I say is the ecosystem of attacks? How do you be uh, eco-friendly in, in the whole attack game? And what's the new wave of attacks that we're gonna see? <laughs> And then we'll talk about how to mass manufacture all these exploits, how to take your work and push it out to the masses with a little bit of help from people and the internet. Okay, so first deal of the day, let's talk a little bit about evolution. And there's four factors that I wanna talk about in evolution. There's complexity of software, which is obviously growing Software is getting more complex every day, every minute, every hour. And as complexity rises, we have bugs. You've, you've seen the plethora of bugs. Right? You've seen all the patch Tuesdays, you've seen all the Microsoft bulletins. Adobe is now the darling favorite child of all hackers, like yeah, let's beat on Adobe and kick the, kick the shit out of PDF. Um, and you'll wonder that why on earth does PDF have a whole JavaScript engine built into it? Do you know that? You, you've installed Adobe Reader, right? The damn thing takes 120 megs on your file system. To do what? Show pages that could be printed? No, it can run JavaScript, it can embed Flash objects, it has a Flash to PDF bridge. I don't know what Adobe is thinking, but they're obviously not thinking right. So yeah, with all this complex software, get what, guess what we're gonna have? Bugs, and lots of them. And these are being found. The other thing I want to talk about is secure coding practices. Right? 
I mean, I've been a security practitioner for years, like taught classes, done the web hacking thing, done the pen testing, and then clients come and ask me saying, okay, so how do we patch this? How do we fix this? And me being an elitist say, oh, ha ha, you can't patch this, like, you're screwed. You've got to fix the code, right? You've got to get it right in the design because there's, there's no patch for KLS design. Now, it's easy for me to say that. I can get away by saying it and, well, other developers are left saying, oh, shit, you know, we have this old legacy system. It's running on some weird AS400 stuff, and you've got to keep our Oracle and Apache and everything together because our business needs it. Today, if you want to write a single application in a secure fashion, it's almost impossible to find good documentation, good examples, and proper methodology. These three things have sort of vanished from, you know, from, from the world. You don't have good documentation at all. I mean, look at Java documentation. Still stuck in 1996. I mean, Sun hasn't really done much, sadly. There's no tight integration with the IDE. There's, you know, no new examples. Everybody does things differently, cobbles it together. And how is code written today? If you want to write code, you open up Google, you search for, okay, how do you make a threaded database connection, copy paste some code, push it in, get it going, and life's good. Yeah, that's how coding is done. I mean, I will say this, being a Microsoft hater, I will say this, that the only good source of documentation out there is MSDN. I mean, if something comes close to being even called documentation, I would give the vote to MSDN. They, they still have a long ways to go. They don't, they don't tell you everything, and they're also like a little bit screwed up inside. But at least there's something there. There's something to read and something to browse through in an organized fashion, not just go cut and paste code. Third factor in evolution is user awareness. I, I am not going to say anything more about it. Right? We have been, over the course of years, the internet has trained us to do what? Click on buttons and get them out of our way. Click OK, click Next, install software, Next, 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 Next. Do you, do you surrender your firstborn child? Yes, Next. Uh, do you, uh, you know, do, do, you, do you, like, you know, mortgage your home and, you know, all your livelihood? Yes, 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 Next, 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 finish, install, done. So if you, today, if you're, you know, writing an exploit and there's a couple of dialog boxes popping up in your exploit, don't worry. People will just click them OK. <laughs> Trust them to do the right thing, man. You just have to tell them what to do and they'll do it. Because if, if it's on the internet, it is true. Right? Yeah. And the last thing I want to complain about is the quality of standards. And they've taken an about turn. Things began great with the RFCs, yeah. I mean, um, everything was good, everything was publicly voted upon. And then, I don't know, but everything fell apart. Everybody wanted to pull things in their directions. Microsoft and Netscape systematically destroyed HTML, and it is in a pathetic state even today. And right now, to make matters worse, Google's getting in on the party. Like, oh, hey, we want to own the HTTP. Google's coming out with their own HTTP protocol called Speedy. Yeah, and they're integrating it with Chrome. Yeah, well, great, you know, yet another one. And it's going to screw up everything. So there's no organization of standards. And standards really haven't even moved much. It's been what? 15 years since HTTP came on? 15, 20? I, I don't know. I can't remember. But what's the progress made in HTTP? Version 1.0 to 1.1. Wow. 0 0.1 is, is what we've gained in 15 years. And I was actually amazed. You, um, anybody see Sir Tim Berners-Lee interview a, a few weeks ago? He was asked, like, what could he have done better about the whole HTTP thing. He says, yeah, well, I would have dropped those two HTTP slash slash. I would have dropped those two slashes. Like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> is, that all, is that all you thought of, like, just dropping those two slashes? Never mind. So, OK, enough of complaints. Let's get on to the attack ecosystem. This is the attack surface of tomorrow. Everything that lies beyond port 80 or port 443 or whatever HTTP runs on. So all your web applications, all the fun stuff, SQL injection, like cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, all that. And 
The other attack surface is on all clients, especially browsers, documents, and PDF. I'm, I'm singling out PDF because PDF gets special treatment. Yeah. And there's new bugs coming out for all of these platforms every now and then. And we'll do a couple of demos and show you how, e how easy it's to exploit these. And things get a little easier when all these other comedians join the gang. You have QuickTime, Flash, Media Players, Java, Silverlight. Well, how do these affect the whole game? Well, these are all plugins and helpers, and you, you, can, you can invoke a Flash object through Opera, you can run QuickTime through Safari, and these really help you in writing, in, in getting stable exploits going. You know, you may turn off executable pages from IE's heap. Well, guess what? I'm going to do a Flash heap spray, and Flash will mark the pages executable, and everybody has Flash, great, win. Safari may be okay, but QuickTime gets bombed every now and then. Like QuickTime is a, one of the most exploited pieces of software around. So if you have a vulnerable version of QuickTime, which you will if you're a Mac user, or you will if you're an iTunes user, you can always exploit something in QuickTime through Safari and own Safari. So these helpers are pretty cool. Um, so to summarize, the open exploit vectors today, you have browsers and their plugins, applications, databases, anything that runs on the app layer, and documents and libraries. I mean, these are the open areas of attack. I've been teaching classes on exploits, as some of you may have seen uh, the browser attacks, but for a larger public benefit, let's talk about browsers and attacks. I mean, whenever we're attacking a browser, you know, remember that a browser is not quite your everyday application. A browser is very special. A browser has to be treated very specially, and browsers do special things. But the fun in attacking a browser is because browsers typically look like this. This is <laughs> what people's browsers are. <laughs> Completely insane. What's all this stuff? Yeah. Toolbars and plugins and helper objects and media players and everybody and their brother wants to be in your browser because they want to steal stuff and they want to get marketing information. But for us, the fun is any of these can be exploited and pretty trivially and we get complete control of the browser. So breaking browsers is fun, and you have all these other you know, browser friends and all to, to finish the job. Let me give you a quick demo. Let's you know, put the slides away for a while. I'll show you how browser exploits work, really. So OK, there's my Windows test desktop. And here we have some browsers. OK, so here's Internet Explorer. Um, let me make sure things are working, though. Ah, OK, yeah, things are working. So there's a couple of browser exploits that I have. If I can find them. OK, oh, moment. You know, always demos break, so. Demos have to break. I hate that. Um, just give me a second. embarrassing when this happens, but I know you're a wonderful audience and you won't you know, harass me for all this. Okay, so. Ah, now we have it. Okay, so here's a browser exploit. There's a HTML file which, uh, which I can show you what it is. And so this is the file. It's a pretty, pretty recent bug that came out. It's IE7. 
Now here's th this entire exploit is delivered through HTML and JavaScript, and we'll see how that's really useful going ahead when it comes to beating the hell out of Norton and McAfee. Um, so this is where we trigger some sort of a memory corruption bug, jump to an address, load up our shell code in the address, and do some of the class guys will recognize a donkey way of exploitation. Uh, and all I have to do is click on this, and with any luck, IE will turn into calculator. Okay. It's a nice magic trick. So like, if you actually look at any zero-day exploit on Windows, all of them will run a calculator. And calculator is like the hello world of all shell code, as I call it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, well, we, we have a proof of concept. So, you know, if you can run a calc, like you're cool and all that. And I should actually get a shirt printed with a calc on it. Ooh, that's elite. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, what will happen now if there is such a web page on the internet and you click on? You can get owned. I mean, not only can a calc be popped up, but we can do something pretty evil like you know, infect your machine with a Trojan, and I'll also give you an idea of what new Trojans are gonna look like. We've been dealt with some old school Trojans, but it's time for the new stuff. So you have all sorts of browser exploits going around. The deal is, how are we going to get people to click on these type of malicious pages? One way is, yeah, you know, put them all in, you know, run your own porn site and everybody comes there and gets owned, but well, herding people to your sites is a very difficult task. You'd rather want to just go and push your work out to the masses. It's very easy to do so. And you have a whole lot of friends on how to take your exploits and push them out to the masses. You can use Google, you can use Google for anything, of course. Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, all your social networking sites. Publish a link, people will blindly click on it. You know, oh gosh, it's on Facebook, man, that's so cool. So yeah, publish all your exploit links through Facebook, put some funny pictures, put pictures of cats in coffee cups and all that. Everybody will come and look at it. Right? Tweet about it and sneak these in. If you're not satisfied with the pace of social network attacks, you can use classic SQL injection, cross-site scripting, and really, really mass multiplier attacks. And another thing that really goes wrong is, like, which idiot in this universe invented URL shorteners. Yeah. They're the most pathetic thing that ever happened to HTML and HTTP. Well, I, I'm saying it from a standards point of view, from an attacker's point of view, it's great. Because now what? With, with URL shorteners, you can completely disguise all your attacks and nobody will know. You can say script source equals bitly, blah, 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 and the browser will diligently follow all the 302s and run that script. So if I give you a link like this, I mean, is it safe or unsafe? Can you tell? It's good. No? It's, it's good, yeah, this is a good link. So yeah, we can click on it. So, um, and here's another trick. Here's actually a really, really, really cool trick. What you can do is take a script like this, take a script like, this is your classic uh, cross-site scripting testing script on hackers.org, xss.js. Search for feed proxies, search for redirectors, search for print-friendly URLs. So search on the internet for something like proxy.asp, URL equals blah. You'll find a whole list of websites which are either redirecting you or formatting an article in a printer-friendly format. Or in this example, it's like a proxy-based feed reader, an RSS feed proxy. Use these and start pulling out your evil JavaScript through somebody's feed proxy. So guess what you've done? You've covered your tracks. Nobody goes to saumil.net slash onu.js. They will go to something like T-H-E-I-L, I found this this morning. Proxy.asp, URL equals this. So now your script is being delivered through this domain, which you may not, which you may not know or you may accidentally trust. And then you can bitly it or is good it, and then you get something like this. Let me actually show you this thing. If it works, it would be very brilliant. Um, and if I can get my mouse pointer, yeah, that's even better. So, let's see. Let me get 
gets rid of this guy. Okay. So I have just a single script tag So here's, here's just a single script tag, right? A is good, blah, blah, blah. See how this thing plays out. And I'm going to try and see. I think I have, oh, no, I don't have no script installed. What happened? Everything just broke on me. Um, let me. Let me get no script installed so I can, like, do a real rock-solid demo. Mine was good. Okay. Uh, hang on. Okay. And let me get this guy on. Add to Firefox. Okay. okay, so I've got no script on. I'm going to restart Firefox there. OK, so now no script is installed, and it's supposed to protect us from everything. Right. Uh, yeah, dream on. Uh, OK, there, finally. Ooh. Um, so let me go to this one, and there's a, this test reader. This is the script tag that I showed you. And so, OK, first thing we're getting is a script object. Let me actually blow it up and show you for the benefit. So first, this, this guy complains, so saying, OK, it's allow it from is good. Do you want to allow it from is good? Well, if you want the script to run, OK. If not, no problem. What we're doing is really forcing the user to make all the mistakes. So OK, now do we want to allow everything from example.com? Well, that's my own web server, so sure, for the demo, I will do that. And then, uh, now, here's the thing. It's going to say, do you want to allow the script to run from thill.com? It's not going to say hackers.org at all. So we say, OK, this. And sure enough, you get this cross-site scripting pop-up. So this is a cool way you can completely disguise all your tracks. Nowhere was hackers.org ever in the picture. It's not showing up. And the scripts are still being delivered. So guess what? If you're like a if you're like a botnet herder and you're running these malware loader sites, you can like use Google and use URL shorteners to completely disguise your tracks, and nobody can know. So no whitelisting, blacklisting, and all that garbage. So yeah, you can shorten all this stuff and you know make real cool URLs out of this that nobody can know. Coming up to the next big thing, this whole web hacking game. How can we use classic web hacking to push our exploits to the masses? One of the most common techniques, I mean, two most common techniques are cross-site scripting, but an even deadlier technique is SQL injection. You all heard of something called mass SQL injection? This is what it is. So, uh, well, I had to throw that lol cat. Uh, this is a classic SQL injection vector which will insert this text, script source equal to blah, blah, blah. This script tag is your malicious exploit loader. This script tag will probably open up four iframes and shove the most popular exploits down the browser. One of them has to pop and the browser is owned. This text is appended to every row of every varchar column of every table of your database for all user object types. This is a SQL server syntax. So somebody pretty clever and creative came up with this one cursor, which will do this in a single SQL query. Doesn't require much. Okay. Now, let me show you this SQL injection stuff and how we can shove this thing in. One more. Uh, So here's a, okay. 
So here's the, here's the injection thing that I'm going to do. This is the SQL statement that I want to inject. And all I got to do is find a vulnerable site and inject this into. So let me give you a quick, simple example, and then we'll show you know, how this works on the real internet. Um, here, so here's the script. What I'm doing is it's the same script, and I am injecting JavaScript, which is like script source equals my JavaScript. This delivers that exploit, so the calculator popping exploit that I just showed you. So this will be now inserted into all the tags on this vulnerable web app. Let me show you what this is. Okay, so here's my classic vulnerable web app. This, this thing has been used for years in all my demos. I, I still love to use it. They used to teach web hacking a while ago and it was fun until I got bored, but the demos still live on forever. Right? Okay, so here's a classic SQL injection point. Like you, you know, whenever on the internet you find a URL like this, like some natural instinct tells you, okay, I'm gonna start you know, putting a single quote and breaking the SQL query and all that. Now here's a broken SQL query. We can do some fun stuff like, yeah, or five equals five and all that, and you know, get all this thing to work. So here is a good SQL injection point. Well, what do you do over here? You take, you take this text, copy it, paste it all over here, bam, put a comment. Now if this works, Come on, man. Don't be blowing up on me. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay. Let me try another one. Demo fail. No, no, no. No proxy. No. This is what I call a demo fail. Demos will fail from time to time. Try this one. Ah, okay, well, I had to just encode it using URL encoding, and now this works. This didn't give me an error, so now, if I actually, what has happened is, let me, let me show you, let me show you with Firebug on. By the way, if you're doing web hacking, Firebug is your friend, remember that. Works in many places, including hotels. <coughs> Okay, so now you're looking at all these requests. Check out what's happened. Every like third or fourth request that you see is a request to this attacker script. Since I'm running on Firefox, it's not targeting to Firefox right now. But you, you see all the text is a little bit mucked up. This script tag has been injected into every text field on this application. So whoever visits this application will get owned. Now, how many such infected applications are there, out there? Tons. I know, sadly, the Bank of India was serving this type of malware for six months, and their auditors told them they're safe, so they were safe. The auditors are never wrong. Yeah. Enron had good auditors. Satyam had good auditors. So here we are, we just opened that web store doing nothing and all of a sudden, if the demo gods are with me, you should see calculators on the screen. I haven't really optimized this exploit, so it takes a little while. Oh, come on, please. It's embarrassing. Oh well. Oh, hey. It worked. So there. <laughs> okay. So well, this is how you take your work to the masses. Like now, how do you go about finding such vulnerable web apps? Where do you do where do you turn to when you want to find stuff? Google. Here's actually a screen cap of a tool that was discovered, that this was like a malware planting tool 
This tool used to run Google queries like in URL dot ASP in URL A equal to. It will find out all these URLs which have some arguments like A equal to this, ID equal to that, and it will just try SQL injection. Right? So you can see over here something like this, like law dictionary dot org Q equal to something A, or like viewer dot ASP A equal to blah, blah, blah. These are great candidates for SQL injection. So what you do is take each URL, start pounding it with this script. If it hits, it hits. If it doesn't, move on to the next. And very quickly, you'll have hundreds of infected sites in a matter of hours. Because there's so many still open SQL injections out there. For example, this was, a, this was a screenshot of our local newspaper in my city of Ahmedabad. It's a pathetic tabloid full of garbage, but a lot of people read it. Um, uh, these guys have been hosting malware scripts for around six months. Like you can see over here, this is a place where the script was injected, script source equal to iwdown.com uh, e.js. This loads up the 10 best exploits of today. Uh, now, this tag didn't get rendered properly because I guess this field was being escaped, but what's the dangerous stuff is the tags that you don't see on the browser. Like there's a tag in the article that got rendered, so whoever visits Ahmedabad Mirror will probably, if you know, they have one in 10 chances of getting infected if they have these vulnerabilities. And uh, to do the maths, six million people in my city, 10% may have internet, so 600,000. Out of these, maybe half of them go to Ahmedabad Mirror, 300,000. Even if one person gets infected, uh, still have 3,000 infections in a, in a shot, in a day. It's not bad. Okay, the last bit of the last bit of demos. Let let me also talk about documents. We're not going to spare PDF either. Uh, PDF, I told you, is is like a classic exploit test bed. One is because Adobe is making things more complex. Uh, two is their software was originally designed for just reading documents. Nobody has done a lot of beating up on it. And three is because it is everywhere. So to quote my friend Didier Stevens, he calls this a penetration document format. But yeah, I mean, this is what PDF just did. Let me show you a PDF attack. It's as, it's as funny as the other ones. Um, so demo gods. So here I have a, so here's, so here's a PDF file, like, like a simple PDF file, which contains some text. And at the very end, what I've done is I've just appended my exploit code at the end. Um, if you actually look at PDF file, this is what I did. I just appended my own object in the catalog. So say open action 666, this is, this is me, and I've put all this JavaScript in. And here's a JavaScript. This actually delivers two popular PDF exploits. It's the Adobe dot get, it's the get icon and collab email info, or collect email info, one of, one of the two. But, uh, so here's a shell code. It's lightly obfuscated, it's not super obfuscated. Like I noticed a lot of uh, antivirus programs were, uh, were searching for knob sleds, like %u 9090. So I just replaced it with woot 9090 woot. And in the JavaScript, I'm replacing it back. Um, over here, I have simple, simple obfuscations like this dot AA BBB equals AA DDD. And then I'm just doing replace like collab dot collect email, assembling the exploit, and then setting a timer and blowing it up after 10 seconds. So again, with JavaScript, you get a lot of creative power. Let's see the net effects. So I'm going to, uh, let me download it on the disk and then do it, or it can be done through the plugin as well. Mm. Yeah, so there's this, where did it go? Calc iPhone, huh? okay. save link. Uh, so let's say somebody mailed you a PDF file. PDF files are all over. And uh, okay. now let's open this PDF file. So this PDF file is the latest marketing documentation comparison between a stone and an iPhone. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and in 10 seconds, it's gonna blow up into a calculator. 
So you can read it for 10 seconds, and then you get calcs. Okay? So how cool is that? Um, let me not show you a calculator. Actually, let me, let me like, do one more slide, then if we have time, I'll do another little demo. But yeah, talking about the effectiveness of antivirus, like this last month, 8th October, I emailed a copy of this file to myself, as is, on Yahoo Mail. Yahoo's running Norton Antivirus, and Norton cannot detect anything in this file. It's, it's still OK. I just don't have a late, later screen cap. But the point I want to prove here is, I mean, signature-based scanning is so 2005. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's doesn't work anymore. It makes a lot of money for these companies in selling you subscriptions. It slows down your quad core to like some acceptable levels of speed. Uh, but it doesn't do anything else. Um, well, uh, let me give you one, one demo of a toolbar. I was telling you about the new rootkits. Like rootkits in the past have been stuff like device drivers, you know, keystroke loggers and uh, uh, network sniffers and all that. Now you don't need all this stuff. You know, these things are pretty invasive. They take into your kernel. They're not really stable. People can detect them, and then you know that's that's not a lot of fun. After all, everything happens in the browser, right? So why don't we just create a malicious browser helper object, like a browser toolbar, and hook it in? That will never be detected. It will run every time. And a browser helper toolbar can do everything that a browser can do. Capture your cookies, sniff all your HTTP traffic, <laughs> capture every keystroke that you type inside the browser. OK, let me do a demo. So uh, here, I have a toolbar. Well, it's not really here. But the toolbar will be installed through a PDF. Uh, the PDF, it's, it's the same PDF, but a different attack vector. There's a, there's a toolbar hosted on a site. It will get download installed into Internet Explorer. When the toolbar gets installed, it will actually create a directory in my current user settings. Like, I don't have the directory. The directory will be called data capture. It's not there right now. Um, yeah, the magician has to show you that the hat is empty and all that. So once it runs, it will be created. And in this, I'll just store everything that I type in the browser. So let me go and get that PDF, blow it up, and show you what happens. Okay. Uh, there it is, this, this PDF, data capture iPhone. So it's the same thing with a different shell code in there. I didn't even write the shell code. I took it from Metasploit. It's great. So here we go again, the stone and iPhone comparison. Like after a little bit of time, the exploit's going to trigger. And once it triggers, it's, it's going to download and install a toolbar. And I'll show you the toolbar as well. OK, so it's gone. It's done its job. There we are. We have a data capture directory. Let me enlarge the fonts on this guy so you can see well. Okay, big ass fonts. Um, now, let's see what happens to IE. Uh, in IE, there's a hidden toolbar already installed. Um, not here. It's going to be in toolbar view, toolbars, data capture toolbar. I mean, we've put some hooks so that we can enable it and see it, but ideally, this would be hidden. Nobody sees these things. Uh, let me unlock the <coughs> toolbar and show you. So yeah, here's what data capture toolbar does. You can, you know, let's say I'm going to my Yahoo Mail. There I'm connected. I'm typing something over here. There, OK. So it's pretty secure password. I can say capture data, or I can even say auto capture. It'll do it for every page. And then I say, OK, let's go to sign in. Of course, I deliberately typed the wrong password in here. But uh, that's because I'm going to show you what I've captured. Yeah. Yeah. 
And here's a log file of everything that we capture. So yeah, I went to Yahoo and this was the login ID, this was the password, uh, and here's the cookies, and here's the URLs that I'm going to go. You know, I can like say, search for deep sec. Everything's gonna be logged. Uh, let's say open it up again. So yeah, this is actually the future of, yeah, now you go to search.live.com. So this is the future of rootkits. I mean, the, these things will be hidden, very hard to detect. The only way of detecting is through com IDs, com object IDs, and you just keep on making new ones up and keep beating the scanners. So coming to all this, I just want to conclude really quickly. The only way we're going to win this game as far as security professionals go, this is the time that we actually need to clean up our act in browser design. So yes, we need a better browser security model. We would hopefully need a better standard. I mean, HTML5 is the new standard, but HTML5 actually does nothing for security. It has introduced 600 JavaScript events. There's an event if you're looking towards the left-hand side of the screen. There's an event if you sneeze but there is nothing about security in there. It's only going to create problems. There are things like selective bypass of the same origin policy so that you can mash up everything. You can get a list of all the public toilets in Vienna mashed onto Google Maps. I mean, HTML5 allows you to do that, but nothing about security. And HTTP as a standard is still pretty broken. So the only solution you have, as I say, is security by pop-ups or you take a huge dose of this. Uh, so, well, questions, comments, or anything, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> what would I like to see in HTTP? Two things. Stateful TCP connections, so we don't have to do all these get and fetch every time. So classic client-server applications used to be connected the time you log in till the time you disconnect. Stateful TCP connections, possibly no loading of external sources if the application dictates it. Like I should be able to have my application say that my application is self-contained. It does not need scripts or images or anything from other sources. So HTTP as well as HTML has to be able to enforce this type of an isolation. Uh, if there's one thing I would like to see, it's stateful TCP connects. If there's two things, it's stateful TCP connects and isolation. The third thing I want to see in HTML in the browsers is some mode of privileges like Consider, consider an operating system, consider programs. You have a program to open up a raw network socket. What does the OS do? Checks your privilege. If you're root, only then it'll give you the raw network socket. Otherwise, the system call will fail. Something like this, when a, when a browser is loading up HTML and the HTML is loading up a script tag or even a reference to a com object or a toolbar or a browser overflow, there should be some sort of privilege checking, like, does the user even want this thing to run? I mean, these things, all these toolbars and plugins, think of them as drivers or kernel objects. User land code should not have direct access to kernel objects without privilege checking. So there has to be some sort of privilege granularity built into browsers. So there's one step in the right direction that is nowadays everybody's learning to isolate tabs in different processes. Like Chrome does it, IE does it, each tab has its own process. That's good, that's okay, it's like wearing a shirt instead of running naked, but uh, it's not enough. You know, it's, it's still everything, it's like browser security is like DOS. You run a program, that program has the ability to do everything, user land, kernel, whatever it is. That's what browsers are like. If a standard has to be implemented, I would hope that it gets implemented at least in IE and Firefox with a common format. The other two browsers don't have a sufficient market share, so they'll always catch up and copy whatever these two do. But I've seen Microsoft implementing their means of cross-site scripting protection. I've seen um, Net, I mean Mozilla implement their means of anti-phishing, but there's no common tags. 
So everybody falls back down to the lowest common denominator, which is nothing. Yes? Uh, yeah, so Google's, I mentioned this earlier, so Google's been making efforts to make a new HTTP. They call it Speedy, S-P-D-Y. Their whole game is they want to stop this latency business. They want to avoid multiple socket connections and reload. It's basically, if you look at it, it's a glorified version of pipelined connections over HTTP 1.0. That's what they're doing. They're holding it open and they're doing all the pipeline requests. But that still doesn't, uh, that doesn't fix this whole statelessness problem. Uh, again, I'm, I'm beginning not to trust Google very much. They, their own protocols and, uh, I mean, just because it's Google, it's not really well tested. Although they own the internet, but it's still not really well tested, right? And, uh, if it has to be accepted, it's to become a standard. Apache, IIS, they should start adopting it so you can have your web servers shoving that protocol out, and then your browser is using it. I'm not too sure about speedy. As far as security goes, there's nothing in it. It's just speed. Any more? Well, all right, thank you very much. Have a nice day, enjoy the city.